Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, Occupy a Fairbanks sponsoring panel discussion. Uh, tonight we'll be discussing uh, the several issues that uh, inspired the Occupy movement. And uh, it's our effort to uh, find some potential solutions to the several endemic American issues. It's our hope that discussions like tonight uh, may help inspire the development of some practical solutions to complex socioeconomic inequalities inherent to American society. So uh, I'll just start off with, uh, so to finish my introduction, I am a uh, super, super senior here at the university. I'm a political science student and uh, also a uh, wildland firefighter for the state of Alaska. Um, so now we'll go over to the panelists. Uh, the gentleman on my uh, closest to me on the right, uh, his name is uh, Dirk Nelson. Uh, he is a 35-34 year Alaska resident. He began working farms in the Midwest at age nine, traveled North, America, traveled North America by thumb, motorcycle, and many other vehicles. Dirk's a former licensed clinical social worker, former licensed marriage and family therapist, sometimes writer, former activist, activist, and former many other things. He's been wrestling for numerous years to discover what defines him currently. He's married to a patient and skilled woman and has raised or is raising three amazing children. He has been active in drug law reform for over 30 years, was co-founder of the Fairbanks Bill of Rights Defense Committee. Uh, their uh, endeavor was to contest the US Patriot Act, USA Patriot Act, and is a supporter of the Occupy Wall Street movement. He considers himself to be a nonpartisan, non-joiner, eccentric, and finds less reason to tolerate or be patient with the direction in which the country has been headed for the last numerous decades. He currently fills the role. <laughs> he currently fills the role of quasi subsistence hunter and gatherer, as well as mostly organic farmer, farmer uh, for his family, while waiting for the sun to ultimately supernova thus returning the planet to the rats and cockroaches, which will, no doubt, serve, a superior, serve as superior stewards when contrasted to the average wayward homo sapiens. Uh, I gotta take a breath. <laughs> so uh, our next esteemed, uh, esteemed panel member is uh, Michael Pippinger. Um, he uh, joined the UAF faculty in 1991. Uh, he's associate professor of economics. Um, he got a Bachelor of Science in Econ from Ball State University, uh, a Master's in Social Science from the University of Chicago, and a Master's of Science and PhD in Economics uh, from Purdue University. Did I get that all right, Mike? Well, except I'm not as old as Oh, okay. <laughs> Nonetheless esteemed, however. And then I, I think the uh, gentleman in the middle, most of you will uh, recognize him. He asked me, asked me to simply introduce him as Scott from Sitcom. <laughs> and uh, to his right is uh, Dr. Kara Dillard. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and is a professionally trained public dialogue facilitator. Maybe we should uh, switch spots here. <laughs> Care. Uh, her research focuses on understanding and promoting citizen engagement and deliber deliberation in public policy decisions. She has a background in national issue forum style deliberation, having convened and facilitated over 20 community dialogues on topics ranging from health care costs, economic security, mental health care, and the mission of public education. She is currently working to host a series of community forums on the national debt here in Alaska as part of a nationwide project to gauge the opinions and ideas citizens have for solving the debt crisis. Uh, Kara is new to Fairbanks. This is only her second semester at the university, and when she's not teaching class or working on her research, she can find her <coughs> snowboarding and, and skiing at Moose Mountain with her six-year-old son. Okay. Uh, and to her right is uh, Dr. Sean Parsons. He happens to be one of my professors. Um, and uh, Sean is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Alaska. He got his PhD from the University of Oregon 
in 2010. Uh, he is currently working to turn his dissertation, which was on the interaction between the anarchist homeless support group Food Not Bombs and city officials in San Francisco into a book. In addition to Food Not Bombs, Sean has, the cut, has conducted research and published on topics including social movement theory, radical environmental theory, the politics of charity, and climate justice. And uh, last but not least, uh, um, on the very end of the table opposite me is uh, David Giesel. Uh, he is a graduate of the UAF School of Engineering. He took an interest in economics five years ago uh, during his time in graduate school and with the help of some friends started a community group to study philosophy and economics. A re reoccurring topic of discussion in group meetings <coughs> is that in any field, and especially in philosophy and economics, it is important to figure out the right questions to ask, because if the questions aren't right, it doesn't matter what the answers are. So uh, before we go any further, uh, you give it a Before we, uh, before we move on to uh, asking the questions, uh, just really brief about how uh, this discussion is going to be ran. Uh, so the first half will be questions designed uh, authored by Occupy Fairbanks members. Um, each panelist will have three minutes uh, to answer any question they like. They don't have to answer all of them if they don't. Um, and then uh, following that, we'll have a 10 minute intermission. And at uh, which time uh, we will uh, return and ask questions that you guys pose on those little cards that will have passed out, and it'll be your opportunity not only to ask questions of the panel, um, but of occupiers as well. Um, so with that being said, uh, let's move on to the uh, first of our questions. And uh, so we'll start at this end of the table with you here, the first question. Uh, so what effects do you think the current neoliberal capitalist system that dominates the world economy has for health, security, and well-being of humanity as a whole? And additionally, is there an alternative system? I'm totally accepting of non-convention, but I'm wondering if we meant to start with question two. And I will, if that's our intention. Uh, no, I had uh, no specific order. So oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, start with question. I missed that part in my moment of anxious. Uh, I think opportunism ungoverned results in conflict, war, revolution. Anytime persons feel abused, betrayed, uh, undervalued, they will eventually, in one way or another, uh, come to a point where they say no more. Uh, we've seen this in Central America for decades. We've seen this in South America for decades. Uh, more limited. We're seeing this in the Middle East. Uh, you know, everybody wants to get the best deal they can and pay as little as possible. At the same time, they themselves want to receive what they want to receive to make their life more comfortable. And there's uh, a cyclical nature to that, that there has to be a balance of mutual respect within that. Raw capitalism, raw globalism is aggressive. It is uh, war without bullets, for the most part. Um, I prefer to subscribe to what I call capitalism of the soul, unless people appreciate the uh, role, work, product, effort, needs of each person on the wheel. It's a wheel, there are cogs on it. Unless each person feels respected and so on on that wheel, the wheel breaks, and, and the break is revolution, the break is imploded economy, uh, any number of things. That's, that's where I think we're headed. I think some places are already at war over it. Some places are in recession or depression over it, homelessness, unemployment. Uh, there has to be a mutual respect. So yes, I don't know if I answered the question. That's great. Say whatever you want. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, well, I'm not entirely sure what neoliberal capitalist system means. If you mean by the current social order, we'll call it that. If you think about the past hundred years of economic development, just 
not in the West, but in the world, but primarily in the West, standards of living have advanced greatly. And so... You use a lot. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Is it on? Um, so we have to keep in mind that the, our current um, standard of living, the fact that we have the university, that we can have the time to have these discussions, is a result of 150 years of economic development based upon, well, I don't know what the liberal, capital, neoliberal capitalist system is, but I think it's more properly called the enterprise economy. Um, and as a result of individual initiative and also interacting with others, um, you're able to better yourself. Um, that's the basic part of the enterprise system. Um, and through that, we've seen great advances in standard of living, life expectancy. Um, we live at the richest time in the history of the Earth in one of the richest countries. That being said, the world is not a perfect place. The world has been going to hell in a handbasket since there's been a handbasket. So we need to keep that in mind. Many of the problems we're talking about here have been discussed for 100 years. They're being presented in a slightly different way. Um, and some of the issues are a little bit different. But um, our discussion about these issues, some of these issues, these are not new discussions. Um, and uh, so our current state, as a result of the neo-capitalist liberal system, um, well, there's been, there's good sides and there's bad sides to those developments. Um, and on the whole, uh, in the West, we've benefited. Now, outside of the West, in other countries, developing countries in Africa in particular, they haven't. But to a great extent, that's been our fault uh, in the way that we tried to promote economic growth abroad. But um, in any event, um, as a couple of perspective, things may be bad, but let's be a little bit realistic here. Things are not that bad. Um, we have problems. They hopefully can be dealt with. We also have to remember that some problems are intractable and can't be solved. Um, and so as far as the neoclassical system dominates the world economy, health security, well-being, and humanity as a whole, I have no idea what direction the world um, economy, health system, security is going to go under any system. So I'm not going to try to predict that. Okay. But if you look at the past 100 years of historical development, um, the uh, amount of free time that we have in the opulent society allows us to have discussions over these issues rather than, rather than spending all of our time hunting or agriculture we have time to do things like education we have time to do things in leisure activities which I suppose this is in part of the leisure activity um, and um, our standard of living is, is the highest standard of living uh, that has ever existed in the history of mankind. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, I don't really need to cut you off, but it's uh, Scott's turn. Um, well, I, I guess I would add to what uh, I believe Michael was was um, was also alluding to. That being um, that, I think it is important for us to take inventory that. We as Westerners are enjoying a culture, an economy um, that probably places us as being the richest human beings in the history of humanity. Um, there is a TED talk floating around on the internet where uh, an academic, a researcher suggests that this is the safest time in the history of humanity to live. That we are less likely to be killed by the hands of another human being uh, globally than at any other time in the history of of mankind. Um, you know, but when I take a look at this question, I guess I would flip it back to the audience and to the panel to contemplate. Um, it brings to mind a uh, kind of a pop, a pop archaeologist, pop anthropologist named Jared Diamond, who wrote an op-ed in the New York Times maybe two, three years ago. 
And Diamond talks about the consumption quotient, which is basically uh, a quotient uh, from which all consumable goods that, is, that are required to live a certain type of lifestyle within a given culture require. The developing world is base one. China is 11. The United States is base 32. Meaning that the United States consumes 32 times more what is consumed in the, in the developing world uh, to live our standard lifestyle. What's interesting is that whether it be Kenya, whether it, so whether it be Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, every uh, freely elected or seemingly or quasi freely elected uh, democracy on the planet, um, politicians talk about delivering a Western style life to their people. So if you're in Kenya and they have British common law there, if you're in Belize, um, chances are you're going to hear a politician, you're going to see a poster, um, you're going to hear somebody promising education, public works, uh, infrastructure development, similar to what is enjoyed in the United States as a baseline for uh, a good life, a solid economy. Um, well, here's the catch. Let's say that through the breakdown of, of, of barriers, through social networking and the expansion of technology, if you were to consider um, a, a alternate reality 20 years from now where things actually go good for humanity, and we all start to um, learn from one another how to govern, how to maintain individual liberty while also uh, having respect for the commons, uh, learning how to, to, to live market economies respectfully, uh, uh, where we value every human on, on the planet. The total number of resources that would be required for the, every base one country on the planet to live a United States style base 32 um, standard of living would be the resource equivalent of placing 70 billion people on the planet. Three minutes. Um, three Earths. Three Earths. Three Earths, three minutes. My time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly, Dave, you're not a professor because you always begin your lectures by defining the key terms so that your students knew what is going on. Um, so what is neoliberalism? The question is, what's neoliberalism? Take it for what it sounds like. It is a freeing of uh, the liberal state, liberal state meaning the government. So it is a new freeing or a new liberation of the economy. So the question is, well, what is the problem with sort of this freeing of the economy? I'll leave it to Michael to talk about, since he's the economist on the panel, to talk about the, eco the economics of neoliberalism. And maybe I'll let Sean talk about the political science of freeing the economy or freeing the government from the economy. As a sociologist, I want to talk about the impact of uh, the United States adoption of neoliberalism from a cultural perspective. Um, and I think that as in the United States, we've adopted neoliberalism as an economic perspective, as a political philosophy, but we, it's also something that we've adopted culturally. It's now a cultural standard. And the effect has been to vary, to alter dramatically the very nature and interpretation of what democracy means in America. And so my argument, or an answer to your question, is that the power of the people, the thing that makes democracy in America so powerful compared to other nations that we like to compare ourselves to, is that the power of the people is naturally expressed in democratic practice has been replaced by the power of economic markets to represent the opinions of people. Markets determine what our opinions are as representative to politicians, not our actual votes. Uh, I would argue that our democracy has legitimacy because it claims to grant equal access to political apparatus, to voting essentially, no matter our social class, no matter our gender, no matter our race, no matter our socioeconomic status, no matter our gender, or sex, or sexual orientation. You cannot say the same things about the markets giving us access to political choices and political opportunity. However, Americans have come to believe that the markets represent a far more democratic form of social and cultural orientation. <coughs> markets are highly rational. Politics is not irrational. Politics is highly uh, 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 irrational and emotional. For heaven's sakes, Rick Santorum is leading in Michigan, and he's still attorney <laughs> law, we're talking about birth control. Uh, but the major impact is the erosion of citizenship, the meaning of citizenship, and the meaning of, and the importance of civil society in America. When citizens are absent any sort of conviction of other, 
citizens now are absent any conviction of, as Scott said, of you know, the commons or of what is good for our neighbors. So in Fairbanks, we have a discussion over the air quality in, in, in our community. We have citizens who are saying, well, I have a wood boiler and it's my God-given right to burn however much pollution that I want to burn because it's my decision to burn as whatever pollutant I want because I need, I need cheap oil, I need cheap fuel. No matter that my whole community is smoke-filled, but it's your right to put yourself and your individual liberty over the common good. And so this idea of neoliberalism says that I have to value what I want at the behest of everybody else. And I think that's the main problem of neoliberalism. So I want to pretty much add a little bit onto what Kara just mentioned. Um, so to begin with, Generally, when people talk about neoliberalism, they talk about the privatization of government services. So the privatization of prisons is an aspect of neoliberalism. And generally, that's seen as a weakening of the state. And I actually radically disagree with that view. Um, in reality, neoliberalism removes something that was once a politically contestable topic out of the realm of politics and into the realm of the market. So when you privatize prisons, you don't cease making prisons political. You just depoliticize prisons. Now it's run by market mechanisms about efficiency, et cetera. It's not about values such as treatment of prisoners or um, you know, punishment versus rehabilitation. It removes the values and moves it into a market concept. Um, the, the Princeton political theorist Sheldon Wollin refers to this process as inverted totalitarianism. It is the corporatization of social services in our lives, and, re and the removal of political control from being able to have uh, institutions that affect you. Um, Jennifer Wolch, who's a social work professor at Berkeley, refers to it as the shadow state, a state that emerges from economic relations that is just as authoritarian as any other state apparatus. So, in general, though, I, I also believe that neoliberalism believes the idea that economic growth is a paramount value of life. And I personally believe that it's about personal, uh, social, economic, and political development. And I think there's a difference between growth and development. All living entities grow, but usually they stop at a certain point. If they don't, they become cancerous. Well, all of us are developing constantly. We're constantly developing emotionally, psychologically, spiritually in some people. And I think that's a big difference between economic growth and development. And I pro personally promote development. Um, in addition, I think capitalism as an economic system naturalizes itself and makes it believe that it's this always existing, never changing system, that capitalist relations have always existed in the world. And I don't believe that's true. It hides alternative forms of economic relations, such as gift economies that have dominated so many different parts of the world. Um, and in general, I would promote a personal system that is a, what's called participatory economics. It's about expanding economic democracy, social democracy. And in general, I believe that if there is an economic system that cannot be controlled by direct democratic means, it's too large to exist. That's my own personal view. So um, we, we started off, uh, or Sean started off by talking about the, uh, the loss of political control with prisons. Um, I would remind everybody that the laws that lock these people in cages for having the wrong plant in their pocket are political, right? Without the political process, the prisons, there would be no prison industrial complex, right? The political process makes that possible because the only people who we sanction to point guns at us and drag us off to a cage are government officials, right? We refer to somebody who kills someone else as a murderer unless they're in the right costume with the right badge. That is a political power that we grant people. So Franz Oppenheimer, in his book, uh, Der Staat, which is the state, he said there's only two means of acquiring wealth. There's the political means, which is a reallocation of wealth. Most of us would call this theft. Um, we have this euphemism called taxation. Uh, it makes it seem cute. And then there's, then there's the economic means, where you have to exchange with someone. You have to find somebody who wants what you have, and you have, to, you have this coincidence of needs where you might have something they want and you exchange. It's, it's inherently voluntary, it's inherently peaceful. And these are the two options that we have. 
or whatever you want to call it, uh, capitalist, neo, whatever, you know, we, we have the nation state, we have the political means, and we have voluntary trade and exchange, we have the economic means. These are the two choices we're presented with in this universe that we live in. And so, to the extent that any solution is structured around a political system, pointing guns at each other to settle differences of opinion, I would personally oppose that. That's just my subjective value. I think organizing society around guns is a bad way to do it. Um, I think the economic means is a far, far better way to do it. And, and Mike, of course, alluded to this. We've seen a growth of the economic means in the last few hundred years. Unfortunately, we've seen a growth of the political means with that, because whenever people are more free and more wealthy, the state grows because the state is taxing all the wealth that's being created from that voluntary exchange. And so the, the cancer that's growing out of control is the state growing on this, this vast increase in wealth that we've all experienced because of the Industrial Revolution. That's the cancer. Um, briefly, it was, it was talked about, Scott said, we're, we're living in the safest time ever. Uh, well, in the 20th century, there were over 100 million deaths in war at the hands of the state. Right? It was this, the century of World War. And so, and, and what, you know, the, the big corporations uh, point guns at people to extract the taxes to fund those wars? Did big corporations draft those people into the army? No, the state did. Those are, those are political problems. It's 100 million people killed because of politics. 